Aloha, welcome to part two of lecture number 13, which is covering chapter 14, the cardiovascular center or cardiovascular system. Um, so last time we left off, uh, we were talking about uh, the fact that the heart chambers form largely by the folding of the heart and the folding of the heart occurs because the heart tube elongates beyond what the pericardial sac can accommodate. So in order to fit the whole thing in there, it starts folding in on itself. Uh, so that's how we form the different chambers of the heart. Now, uh, today we're gonna talk about how the walls that separate the chambers form. So let's first uh, take a look at, um, so what we're looking at here is a coronal section of a heart with the front removed. So we're looking at the front of the heart with the front of it sliced off, okay? Um, this is 28 days here, 32 days here, 35 days down here, and then this is an eight week heart. Um, I apologize in advance for all the noise that's in the background. My wife is trying to get my kids ready to go out and it, it's just gonna be noisy in here for a while. Sorry about that. Um, right, so the, uh, the interventricular septum is pretty simple, right? The wall that divides the two ventricles, uh, it basically just starts growing gradually from the floor of the heart. It grows up and eventually connects at the uh, pericardial cushion. Um, yeah, basically grows up from the floor until it connects to the top. And now uh, there's a septum between the two halves of the, or the, between the two ventricles. Pretty much end of story. That's about all there is to it. Now the septum between the two atria is a little more complicated. So you have this primary growth out of the roof of the heart uh, called the septum primum, right? The septum primum starts to grow out and as it starts to grow out, it actually breaks off and migrates down and bumps into this uh, piece of tissue down here called the cardiac cushion or the endocardial cushion, depending on which section of the book you're reading. <laughs> um, they call it both things in this book, which I think is kind of ridiculous. They should just call it the same thing throughout, but I didn't write it, so whatever. Um, yeah, so this um, septum primum breaks away, migrates down, and fuses to this uh, cardiac cushion, right? The cardiac cushion is made out of cardiac jelly. It's eventually going to differentiate into cardiac muscle and other structures later on, right? Now, as this thing fuses with the cardiac cushion, there's this secondary growth out of the roof of the heart called the septum secundum. And this septum secundum is gonna start growing downward, but it's not gonna grow all the way down. It's gonna grow only partially down so that it overlaps with the septum premium, right? So septum premium grows out of the top, migrates down, fuses with the bottom, right? And leaves this little flap. Then septum secundum grows out of the top and forms another flap so that these two basically form kind of a valve. This valve is called the foramen ovale or the oval foramen. This uh, foramen allows for blood to flow from the right atrium into the left atrium. Why does that matter, you might ask? Well, you gotta remember all the blood coming in from the lungs is unoxygenated. The lungs are not providing any oxygen at this point the blood coming in from the umbilical vein through the inferior vena cava is oxygen rich, highly oxygenated blood. So the only way to get it into the right atrium is through this foramen. So oxygenated blood flows into the right atrium, into the, or sorry, from the right atrium into the left atrium, then into the left ventricle and out to the rest of the body. So this foramen is the only way to get it oxygenated blood into the left ventricle and pumped out to the rest of the body. That is why that foramen needs to exist. Now, of course, that's gonna go away um, as, soon as, uh, as soon as the baby is born, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, let's move on to the formation or to the separation rather of the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, okay? So you remember we start off with just this big heart tube that's interfolded on top of itself. And we have these structures called the bulbous cortis, which is just the base of the truncus arteriosus. So we have this big, you know, end of the heart tube, right? And what's gonna happen is a spiral septum is gonna form in between these two that's gonna separate them. 
And once that spiral septum is fully formed, the two halves of the tube are gonna separate uh, away from each other and form their own individual tubes. So we have this really cool little animation. Um, I don't know why there's this green flashing thing at the bottom, but it just is what it is, I guess. Uh, so right now there's labeling all the different parts of the heart to orient you to it. Um, and we'll get through that and they'll kind of show you how the septum begins to form. Now I find this to be one of the coolest things that the body does. So it starts on the two halves of the heart. Let me get this so that it'll stay on. Um, it starts on either half and it starts to grow in a spiral fashion, right? So this is from the front and this is different sections through, right? The top one, a middle one and a lower one. And that septum just grows from the two sides together in this spiral fashion. And I just really think it's artful and beautiful the way the body does this. So you end up with this septum that is, you know, twisted and spiraling down the heart. And then of course the tubes eventually separate uh, into separate tubes. Um, so now they're talking about the aortic sac, which is just basically the same thing. You just have another section of the septum that goes down from there. Right, pretty simple. And, uh, and that's kind of that. So eventually then uh, we end up with this, right? So these, the spiral septum forms and then as it partitions that tube into two halves, these two spiraling halves then separate and form their own tubes. So you end up with an aorta and a pulmonary trunk. Pretty cool stuff, honestly. I, I love the way that happens. I love the, the way the body does it. Okay, now remember these guys up here, these pharyngeal arch arteries, right? I told you that we were gonna find out what happens to them. And so now we will. Um, so while the heart has been busy forming, a lot of other changes have been happening um, in different parts of the circulatory system as well. And most of this is all happening at the same time. Remember all of these processes, we're talking about them individually, but they're all overlapping. They're all kind of happening as this big symphony all, of this, all at once, right? So we already talked a lot about what happens with the venous system. Um, the arteries are a little less complicated up to this point. Uh, when we started off, we had uh, the pharyngeal arches, right? The pharyngeal arch arteries that all drain into the uh, dorsal aorta. And remember, remember at this stage, we have two dorsal aortas, uh, one on each side of the embryo, right? Um, so what's gonna happen is, uh, uh, well, so first of all, along this dorsal aorta, we have all these little intersegmental arteries. And what these intersegmental arteries are really for is to provide blood supply to the, um, the somites, right? They provide blood, blood supply to the somites is what they're for at this stage. Now, most of these dorsal aorta or mo most of these intersegmental arteries rather are gonna either degenerate into nothing. Some of the upper ones are gonna become, uh, merged together and become the cervical arteries that run up the, um, the cervical spine on either side into the brain. Um, some of them are gonna become um, the costal arteries, right? That run along the ribs, the intercostal arteries rather. Uh, and then most of them are gonna de degenerate and the remnants of some of them are gonna become lumbar arteries. The point is that when all is said and done, none of these guys are still around. They are very much transient structures. They exist for a while, they serve their purpose and they are either uh, reabsorbed or built into other things. Um, now the valatine uh, arteries are ultimately going to become the arteries that supply the gut tube. So there's not really a lot that we need to say about them. Uh, more important though is what happens to these dorsal aortas, right? So while the rest of the circulatory system develops, this caudal portion of the dorsal aortas, they're going to merge together. The two, uh, the two aortas are going to merge together into one tube and form a common thoracic aorta, right? So down here, we have the caudal portion that merges together into the common thoracic aorta. Um, now this is a busy slide. So we're gonna take it one little piece at a time. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so we're just gonna digest, try to digest this one little piece at a time. Um, so you'll notice that the caudal portion of the aorta is fused together to form that common tube, all right? So um, the leftover parts of the first pair of pharyngeal arches, uh, pharyngeal arch arteries rather, are gonna be incorporated. So these guys right here, 
these guys are going to be incorporated into the maxillary arteries and those are going to supply a lot of the face with blood okay um the second pair these guys right here are going to basically you're going to outgrow them and they're going to become very very small and they become this teeny tiny artery called, called the uh, stapedal artery the stapedal artery uh, supplies the stapes of the ear. It's just a teeny tiny little artery that supplies just that little stapes bone of the ear. Okay, so the third pair of arches, as you can see on the diagram, um, they are going to become ultimately the common carotid arteries, right? The third pair of pharyngeal arches are going to become the common carotid arteries before they split off and go up to the brain. Um, the fourth pair on the left side combines with the um, ductus, arterior, uh, ductus arteriosus and it is going to uh, form part of the aortic arch. On the right side the fourth artery is going to form part of the subclavian or the brachiocephalic artery and then the subclavian artery that goes off uh, that breaks off of the uh, brachiocephalic artery. Right, so that's the, the, the destiny of the fourth pharyngeal arch artery is to become part of the aortic arch on the left and then part of the brachiocephalic artery on the right. All right, now uh, the fifth pharyngeal arch arteries don't always develop. Only about 50% of people ever actually have them. For those that do have them, they are transient and once your body's finished with them, they degenerate. Nothing really becomes of them. If you develop them, they degenerate and disappear. All right now pharyngeal artery number six on the left hand side becomes part of the pulmonary trunk it becomes incorporated into the pulmonary trunk and it forms the ductus arteriosus right so this ductus arteriosus um, allows for further mixture of the unoxygenated and the oxygenated blood right and then um because remember these pulmonary trunk arteries, they're going out to the lungs and the lungs are still developing. So they kind of, <laughs> and all the rest of this is going out to the rest of the body, which also needs oxygen. So this, this just helps to further mix the oxygenated and unoxygenated blood as it goes out to the lungs and the rest of the body, right? The right side of the sixth pharyngeal arch artery is gonna become part of the right pulmonary artery. Uh, and let's see, I think that's about it for um, the pharyngeal arch arteries. <laughs> um, so uh, with the sixth one, the part of it that isn't, that isn't incorporated into the pulmonary um, trunk, the rest of it just degenerates and is reabsorbed. So now <laughs> we have an aorta, we have a heart, we have pulmonary arteries, and we have most of the big first branches uh, off of the aorta. Uh, we formed an inferior vena cava and a superior vena cava. So all that's left really uh, is these pulmonary veins. How do the pulmonary veins get there? Turns out it's pretty simple. You start off with uh, just this one common pulmonary vein and you have four tributaries to it that come out of the lungs, right? So these four tributaries coming out of the lungs, dumping into the common pulmonary vein, uh, that then empties into the... Um, left atria okay um, now as this left atrium grows as the heart gets bigger it basically incorporates this venous tissue into the wall of the heart and as the heart continues to grow it incorporates more and more and more of this venous tissue and it basically gobbles up all of these veins into the heart until what you end up with is no more common pulmonary vein instead you have these four um, tributaries that are now emptying directly into the left atrium, right? Uh, and then because all of this venous tissue is incorporated into the wall of the left atrium, that is why the left atrium, this part of the left atrium appears very smooth when you dissect the heart. This whole section of the wall is really, really smooth and shiny looking. And that's because it's made out of all this venous tissue. So on the quiz and on the test, if somebody were to ask you why uh, the posterior portion of the left atrium appears smooth, it's because the, uh, the venous tissue of the common pulmonary vein is incorporated into the wall 
of the left atrium. Cool. Everybody got that? I hope I didn't say right when I meant to say left or left when I meant to say right. But yeah, you get the pulmonary veins that dump into the left atrium and then the left atrium goes into the left ventricle and that sends oxygen eventually. This is after birth. But anyway, the reason that the left atrium appears smooth on the posterior surface is because of the incorporation of venous tissue from the um, common pulmonary vein. Okay, I think I repeated that like four times. So make sure that you get that one right on the quiz and on the final. Now, um, that just leaves us um, with valves, right? So we've got the uh, great vessels, the heart, the four heart chambers. Let's talk about the valves. The valves are, uh, they all basically form the same way. So we only need to cover it once. The only thing that changes depending on which valve is the position of the valve and then also how many uh, valve cusps form in the valve. Other than that, they all form exactly the same way. You start with outswellings of the great vessels, right? You start with an outswelling of the, uh, sorry, not the, of the cardiac tissue. You start with an outswelling of the tissue and that outswelling is gonna get bigger and flatter until they all come together and form a valve cusp. That's pretty much it, end of story. Here's a look at it from the side, right? You have a valve swelling in the endo endocardial tissue. That valve swelling starts to grow out further and it starts to elongate and thin until it comes together in the middle. And now you have two valve cusps or three valve cusps, depending on which valve it is. Pretty simple process. Also beautiful and amazing and incredible that all these cells know how to differentiate from this endocardial jelly into these valve cusps rather than into cardiac muscle or whatever else they might be able to become. It's just incredible that all of this is programmed into your DNA. I'm telling you, Heavenly Father is the master creator. He is the, the ultimate artist. And I stand in awe and reverence of the absolute beauty and art of the human body. The more I learn about it, the more amazing it becomes to me. Uh, anyway, I digress, okay. So um, that's pretty much the end of story for valve formation, right? Uh, endo uh, valve swellings that elongate, uh, continue to elongate and flatten until they become this, uh, the valves. And, uh, and once the valve cusps are fully formed, they become very, very efficient in most cases at letting blood go one way, but not come back the other, which is very, very important. So that just leaves us with discussing fetal circulation versus neonatal circulation, which as you can see from the diagram is actually very, very different. Now on this diagram, they have highly oxygenated blood colored red, and they have areas of poor oxygenation colored blue, and then areas of in-between semi-oxygenated blood is colored purple, right? Now, the one thing that I would change about this is I would have the left side of the heart also colored purple, but I'm not the author or the illustrator, so whatever. But if I were doing it, yeah, this would also be purple because it's got partially ox or, um, oxygen poor blood coming into it from the heart where it's gonna mix into the left atrium with the high vox. I would just have the left side of the heart be purple if I had drawn it at any rate. Um, so you can see uh, in the fetus, the most oxygenated blood comes out of the umbilicus or becomes out of the placenta through the umbilical vein. This umbilical vein travels up, it goes through the liver, through the ductus venosus into the inferior vena cava, straight into the right atrium, goes through the foramenal valley, into, oops, sorry, that's for next lecture, <laughs> through the foramen valley into the right atrium or into the left atrium and also down into the right ventricle, right? And then all of this uh, semi-oxygenated blood flows out through the arteries into the rest of the body, right? On the flip side, you have the neonate that has highly oxygenated blood coming out of the lungs into the heart um, so, so why the difference? Why do we have all this mixture of blood in the fetus? Well, and the answer is the lungs. It all comes down to the lungs, right? Um, while the fetus is developing, these lungs don't have any oxygen in them. They are not getting any air. So the blood coming out of them is poorly oxygenated. These guys are developing. They need oxygen to develop, but they're not putting any oxygen back into the system. So you have to have this mixture of blood. And it's okay 
to have partially oxygenated blood going out to the developing tissues. Why? Well, because of mom. Mom is eliminating all the wastes. Mom is metabolizing all the food. So by time this blood comes back from the placenta back into the uh, fetus, uh, back into the fetus's body, like it's down to nothing <laughs> except for all of the metabolic building blocks that it needs to grow. There's no metabolism that really needs to happen inside the fetus, which is where most of the energy in your body is spent is in metabolism. Since the baby doesn't have to do that, its only job is to get bigger and grow. And that takes really not a lot of energy. So it doesn't need a ton of oxygen. It just needs some. And so it's okay to mix the blood and send out the semi-oxygenated blood out to the body because all it has to do is get bigger. Those cells don't have to do any, met any metabolic function at all. All they have to do is get bigger. The waste gets sent out through, um, uh, the waste gets sent back to the placenta through the umbilical artery, right? And then mom eliminates the waste, mom replenishes the supplies, mom gives it the oxygen, right? Anyway, there's the, it's really easy on a fetus. Um, whereas when you go into a, a neonate, this guy's cut off from mom's supply. He has to supply his own, he has to eliminate his own waste. He has to supply his own metabolites. He has to basically function all on his own. So it's very important to have very oxygen rich blood going out to all the different parts of the body that now have to metabolize substrates and eliminate waste and do all of that stuff that takes a considerable amount of energy. It needs a lot of oxygen to do that, right? So what happens basically is uh, as soon as baby's born, baby takes his first breath and a very radical change of pressure happens in the thoracic cavity. These lungs inflate for the first time ever and that radically drastically changes the pressure in the thoracic cavity. And that radical pressure change causes this foramenal valley and this ductus arteriosus to collapse and seal. And once they collapse and seal, no more blood can come through either of those two openings. And so we're left with the lungs, which are now full of air that provide a rich supply of oxygen, very highly oxygenated blood flowing back through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. From there to the left ventricle and out to the rest of the body, right? Where it provides metabolites and oxygen and substrates uh, to the rest of the body I'm sorry, not metabolites, substrates and oxygen to the rest of the body in order to uh, efficiently perform metabolism, metabolic functions, which take a lot more energy than just growing does. So now the baby's got to do all this metabolism in addition to growing, so it needs as much oxygen anyway. Um, and then of course, very poorly oxygenated blood comes back to the heart uh, through the vena cava and then goes out through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs where it becomes highly oxygenated again because the lung anyway. So yeah, it all comes down to the lungs. Mixture of blood is okay here and actually very necessary here because the lungs aren't functioning yet. Now the lungs are functioning and they're providing a very rich supply of oxygen. And all that happens in one breath, one breath, a second. That kid takes his first breath and all of this changes so drastically, so immediately. I also find it amazing and beautiful and artful and just awe-inspiring at how it all happens. I just love it. Um, anyway, uh, for purposes of the quiz and the final, a couple of things that you're going to want to know is that what causes the foramenal valley and the ductus arteriosus to collapse and seal is the baby taking its first breath after birth. That first breath causes a radical pressure change which causes the ovale, foramenal valley and the ductus arteriosus to collapse and seal. Okay, remember that. Let me say it one more time. The ductus arteriosus and the foramenal valley collapse and seal upon the first breath due to a radical pressure change in the thoracic cavity. Okay, you also need to know that the most oxygen rich blood is in the fetus located in the umbilical vein, the umbilical vein, not artery. The umbilical vein is where the most oxygen rich blood is located in the fetus. In the neonate, the most oxygen rich blood is located in the pulmonary veins. It's always veins. I always got that question wrong on my tests. 
I always kept trying to put arteries because arteries are where oxygen rich blood. No, the most oxygen rich blood as it enters the heart before it has time to give its oxygen to anybody else as it enters the heart is coming through those pulmonary veins. The most oxygen rich blood is in a vein, whether you're a neonate or a fetus, it just changes which vein, <laughs> right? So in neonates, it's the umbilical vein, or sorry, in fetuses, it's the umbilical vein. In neonates, it is the pulmonary veins. So hopefully I harped on that enough that nobody will get it wrong on the exam, although every single time a whole bunch of people get that one wrong. The most oxygen rich blood is located in the pulmonary veins for the neonate and for the fetus in the umbilical vein. <laughs> All right, I think I beat that dead horse into the ground, okay? Uh, that's gonna wrap it up for the cardiovascular system. If you have any questions or need clarification on anything, please, as I say at the end of every single lecture, write those questions down because you will absolutely forget them if you don't. Write those questions down, bring them with you to the Zoom meeting on Thursday and ask those questions. I love intelligent questions. I can't say it enough. They are absolutely the highlight of the whole teaching experience for me when I get intelligent questions from my students. Uh, if you guys ask a question that I don't know the answer to, that will provide an extra credit opportunity for the whole class. Hasn't happened yet this semester. I think just because we're not in class. So I haven't been getting as many questions from people. But if you manage to stump me, if you ask me a question I can't answer, everybody will get a chance to uh, earn some extra credit from that. Uh, yep, so that's it for today. That's it for the cardiovascular system. Hopefully I will see you on Thursday at the Zoom meeting. Have a great day, aloha.